Hi friends, I'm Cindy. I am one of the children's librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. And today we are going to read more in The House with a Clock in Its Walls by John Belairs, illustrated by Edward Gorey. We had just gotten to the part where Lewis was awakened by the doorbell and we're going to find out who was behind the door. Lewis stood still and watched the shadow. It didn't move. Slowly, he began to walk forward. When he reached the door, he closed his fingers around the cold knob and turned it. The door rattled open and a freezing wind blew in over his bare ankles. There stood his Aunt Maddie, who was dead. Lewis stepped back as the old woman, her head cocked to one side as it had always been, tottered across the floor toward him. A shaking blue light filled the air around her, and Lewis, his eyes wide open in this nightmare, saw Aunt Maddie as she had been the last time he had seen her alive. Her dress was black and wrinkled. She wore heavy shoes with thick heels, and she tapped her bunchy black umbrella as she went. Lewis even thought he smelled kerosene. Her house, her furniture, and her clothing had always reeked of it. The white fungus blotch that was her face glowed and shook as she said in a horribly familiar voice, Well, Lewis, aren't you glad to see me? Lewis fainted. When he awoke, he was lying on his back in the cold hallway. The shaking blue light was gone. So was Aunt Maddie, though the front door was open. Skitters of snow blew in over the worn threshold, and the street lamp burned quiet and cold across the street. Had it all been a sleepwalker's dream? Lewis didn't think so. He had never been a sleepwalker before. He stood there thinking for a minute, and then, for some reason, he shuffled out onto the front porch and started to pick his way down the snow-covered steps. His feet were so cold that they stung, but he kept going until he was halfway down the walk. Then he turned and looked at the house. He gasped. There were strange lights playing over the blank windows and the rough sandstone walls. They wouldn't have been strange lights at midday in the summer, but on a December night they were eerie, for they were leaf lights, the shifting circles and crescents cast by sunlight falling through leaves. Lewis stood and stared for several minutes. Then the lights faded and he was alone in the dark snow-covered yard. The chestnut tree dropped a light dusting of snow on his head, shaking him out of his trance. His feet were numb and tingling and he felt, for the first time, the cold wind whipping through his thin pajamas and his half-open cotton bathrobe. Shuddering, Lewis stumbled back up the walk. When he got to his room, he sat down on the edge of his bed. He knew he wasn't going back to sleep. There were the makings of, the, of a fire in his fireplace, and he knew where the cocoa was kept. A few minutes later, Lewis was sitting by a warm, cheerful fire that cast cozy shadows over the black marble of his very own personal fireplace. He sipped steaming cocoa from a heavy earthenware mug and tried to think pleasant thoughts. None came to him. After an hour of sitting and sipping and brooding, he plugged in the floor lamp, got John L. Stoddard's second lecture on China out of the bookcase, and sat reading by the fire until dawn. The next morning at breakfast, Lewis saw that Jonathan was red-eyed and nervous acting. Had his sleep been disturbed too? Jonathan had not discussed the break-in or the car chase or the Izzard tomb with Lewis, and Lewis was not about to bring up any of these subjects, but he knew that something was bothering Jonathan, and he also knew that ever since the night of the break-in, Jonathan and Mrs. Zimmerman had been holding midnight conferences. He had heard their voices coming up through the hot air register, although he had never been able to make out what was being said. He had thought a couple of times of hiding in the secret passageway, but he was afraid of getting caught. A passage that is entered through a china cupboard full of rattling dishes is not as secret as one might wish. And if some secret spring lock snapped shut on him, he would need to scream his way out, and then there would have to be explanations. Lewis almost wished that something like that would happen because he was sick of his secret. 
He was sick of it because it kept him away from Jonathan and Mrs. Zimmerman. He always felt that they were watching him, waiting for him to break down and tell them everything. How much did they know? Christmas at 100 High Street was both good and bad that year. There was a big tree in the study and gla the glass balls on it were magic. Sometimes they reflected the room and sometimes they showed you ancient ruins on unknown planets. Jonathan gave Lewis several magic toys, <coughs> including a large pink Easter egg or Christmas egg, if you wish, that was covered with sparkly stuff and what looked like icing, although it couldn't be eaten. When Lewis looked into the egg, he could see any battle in history, not the battle as it really was, but as he wanted it to be. Though he didn't know it, the egg, like the balls on the tree, was capable of showing him scenes on other planets. It was not until he was a grown-up man working as an astronomer at Mount Palomar that he was able to discover the property of the magic egg. Jonathan did a lot of other things that Christmas. He put candles in all the windows of the house, electric candles, not real ones, since he liked the electric kind better. And he put strong lamps behind the stained glass windows so that they threw marvelous patterns of red and blue and gold and purple on the dark, sparkling snow outside. He invented the fuse box dwarf, a little man who popped out at you from behind the paint cans in the cellar way and screamed, Dreeb, Dreeb, I am the fuse box dwarf. Lewis was not scared of the little man, and he felt that those who scream Dreeb are more to be pitied than censured. Needless to say, Jonathan put on a very good show with the coat rack mirror, though it had the habit of showing the ruins of Chichen Itza over and over again. Somehow the mirror changed and managed to pick up radio station WGN on its beveled edges, so that when Lewis went out the door in the morning, he heard the Dow Jones averages and the livestock reports. Lewis tried to enjoy himself that Christmas, but it was hard. He kept thinking that Jonathan's magic show was meant to cover up what was really happening to the house. What was happening was hard to figure out, but it was strange and terrifying. After the night when Lewis saw or dreamt he saw Aunt Maddie, the house seemed stranger than it ever had. Sometimes the air in certain rooms seemed to shimmer as if the house was going to disappear in the next second. Sometimes the stained glass windows showed dark and terrifying scenes, and sometimes Lewis saw in the corners of rooms those awful sights that nervous people always imagine are lurking just outside the borders of their eyesight. Walking from room to room, even in broad daylight, Lewis forgot what day it was, what he was after, and at times almost forgot who he was. At night, he had dreams of wandering through the house back in the 1890s when everything was varnished and new. <clears throat> Once or twice, Lewis woke from such dreams to see lights flickering on his bedroom wall. They were not leaf lights this time, but rags and patches of orange light, the kind that you see in the corners of an old house at sunset. These strange things didn't go on all the time, of course. Just now and then, over the long cold winter of 1948 and 1949. When spring came, Lewis was surprised to see that the hedge in front of the Hanchet house was wildly overgrown. It was a spirea hedge and had always had bristly little pink and white blossoms. This spring, there were no blossoms on the hedge. It had turned into a dark, thorny thicket that completely hid the first floor windows and sent long, waving tendrils up to scrape at the zinc gutter troughs. Burdock and ailanthus trees had grown up overnight near the house. Their branches screened the second story windows. Lewis still had not seen much of the new neighbor. Once from a distance, he had caught a glimpse of a dark, huddled figure rattling a key in the front door and from his window seat, he had seen her passing to and fro on the second floor. But aside from that, the old woman had kept out of sight. Lewis had figured it would be like that. She did have visitors though, one visitor. That was Hammer Handle. Lewis had seen him coming away from Mrs. O'Meager's back door late one night, and twice on his way to the movies in the evening, Lewis had literally bumped into Hammer Handle, who was huddling along High Street toward the Hanchet house, his shabby overcoat buttoned up to the neck. Both times, Hammer Handle had been carrying packages, odd little 
bundles wrapped in brown paper and twine, and both times they had collided because Hammerhandle kept looking behind him. The second time they met this way, Hammerhandle grabbed Lewis by the collar, the way he had before. He pressed his unshaven muzzle to Lewis's ear and growled, You little snip! You're looking to have your throat cut, aren't you? Lewis pulled away from him, but he didn't run. He faced Hammerhandle down. Get out of here, you rotten old bum. If you ever try to do anything to me, my uncle will fix you. Hammerhandle laughed, though it sounded more like he was having a choking fit. Your uncle, he said, sneering. Your uncle will get his sooner than he thinks. The end of the world is at hand. Don't you read your Bible like a good boy? There have been signs and there will be more. Prepare. And with that, he stumbled on up the hill, clutching his parcel tightly. The day after this strange meeting was cold and rainy, and Lewis stayed indoors. Jonathan was over at Mrs. Zimmerman's helping her bottle some prune brandy, so Lewis was alone. He decided to go poke around in the back rooms, up on the third floor. The third floor rooms were generally unused, and Jonathan had shut the heat off in them to save money. But Lewis had found interesting things up there like boxes full of chessmen and china doorknobs and wall cupboards that you could actually climb up inside of. Lewis wandered down the drafty hall, opening and closing doors. None of the rooms seemed worth exploring today. But wait, sure, the room with the parlor organ. He could go play it. That would be fun. One of the disused parlors on the third floor had a dusty old parlor organ in it. It was one of the few pieces of furniture that was left from the time Isaac Izzard had lived in the house. Of course, there was the parlor organ downstairs, the good one, but it was a player organ and often refused to let Lewis play what he wanted to play. This one up here was wheezy and in the winter, its voice was only a whisper, but you could sometimes get good tunes out of it if you pumped hard. Lewis opened the door. The parlor organ was a bulky shadow against one wall. Lewis found the light switch and the light came on. He wiped some dust off the seat and sat down. What would he play? Chopsticks probably, or from a wigwam. His repertoire wasn't very large. Lewis pumped the worn treadles and he heard a hissing and puffing that came from deep inside the machine. He touched the keys, but all he got was a gaspy tubercular sound. Darn. He sat back and thought. Over the keys was a row of black organ stops with labels that said thing like, things like Vox Humana, Salicet, and Flute. Lewis knew that these stops were supposed to change the sound of the organ in various ways, but he had never pulled any of them out. Well, now was the time. He grabbed one of the black tubes and tugged gently. It wouldn't budge. He wiggled the stop and pulled harder. The whole thing came out in his hand. Lewis sat there, stupidly, staring at the piece of wood. At first he felt bad about breaking the organ, but then he looked more closely at the stop. The end that had been in the organ was blunt, smooth, and painted black. There was no sign that it had ever been hooked up to anything. What a cheesy outfit, Lewis thought. I wonder if they're all like that. Let's see. He pulled at another. Pop. He pulled them all out. Pop, 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 pop. Lewis laughed. He rolled the black tubes back and forth over the keyboard, but then he stopped and thought. He had read a story once where a car had had a dummy dashboard that came out so you could hide things behind it. What if this organ... He got up and went downstairs. He went all the way down to the cellarway where Jonathan kept his tools. He opened the toolbox and took out a screwdriver, a hammer, and a rusty butter knife that Jonathan kept there for prying things open. Then he went back upstairs as fast as he could. Now Lewis was sitting at the organ again. He scanned the long wooden panel. Seven round black holes stared back at him. There were four screws holding the panel to the organ case and they came out easily. Lewis stuck his fingers into two of the holes and pulled. The panel was stuck. He thought a bit, then he picked up the butter knife and slid it into a crack. Screek! A little eddy of dust rose and tickled his nostrils. He moved the knife along to the right a bit and pried again. Screek! The panel flopped out onto the keyboard. Ah, now we would see what was what. Lewis bent over and put his head close to the hole. He could smell a lot of dust, but he couldn't see a thing in there. 
Darn it, he had forgotten to bring a flashlight. He reached in and felt around. His arm went all the way in up to the armpit. He groped some more. What was this? Paper? He heard a dry crackling sound. Maybe it was money. He grabbed hold of the bundle and pulled it out. His heart sank. <sighs> it was just an old pile of papers. Lewis sat there staring at them in disgust. So this was the secret treasure of Isaac Izzard's castle? Some treasure. Well, there might be something interesting in them, like secret formulas. He flipped through the papers. Hmm. Hmm. He flipped some more. The light in the room was very weak, and the old paper had turned practically the same shade as the copper-colored ink Isaac Izzard had used. He figured the writing must be Isaac Izzard, since the first sheet said, Cloud formations and other phenomena observed from this window by Isaac Izzard. Hadn't Mrs. Zimmerman said that she had seen old Isaac taking notes on the sky? There were dates here and entries after them. Lewis read a few entries and his eyes opened wider. He leafed some more. A spatter of rain hit the window. Lewis jumped. Outside, he could see thick masses of blue clouds piled up in the west. Through them ran a jagged red streak. It looked to Lewis like a hungry mouth. As he watched, the mouth opened and a ray of blood red light shot into the room. It lit up the page he was holding. On the page were scrawled these words, doomsday not come yet. I'll draw it nearer by a perspective or make a clock that shall set all the world on fire upon an instant. Lewis felt very frightened. He gathered the papers together and started to get up. As he did so, he heard a noise, a very faint noise. Something was fluttering around down inside the organ case. Lewis stumbled backward, knocking over the bench. The papers slid out of his hand and scattered all over the floor. What should he do? Run for his life or save the papers? He gritted his teeth and knelt down. As he gathered up the sheets, he said to himself over and over again, quia tu es deus fortitudo mea, quia tu es deus fortitudo mea. Now he had all the papers again. He was about to dash to the door when he saw something come floating up out of the darkness inside the organ, a moth. A moth with silver gray wings. They shone like leaves in the moonlight. And here's a picture of Lewis with the moth. Lewis ran to the door. He rattled the knob, but he couldn't get it open. Now he could feel the moth in his hair. Lewis went rigid. His face flushed. He was not scared anymore. He was angry, very angry. He swatted at the moth and crushed it. Lewis felt a horrible, runny stickiness in his hair, and all the fear came running back. He wiped his hand frantically on his trouser leg. Now Lewis was out in the hall, running and shouting, Uncle Jonathan, Mrs. Zimmerman, come quick. Oh, please come quick. I've found something, Uncle Jonathan. And the next time we read, we will find out what happens when he talks to Miss, Mrs. Zimmerman and Uncle Jonathan. So this is The House with a Clock in Its Walls by John Belairs and illustrated by Edward Gorey. And I hope that you'll come by for the next installment of it. Thanks for stopping by, friends. I'm Cindy. I am one of the children's librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine. Bye-bye for now.